here, so the water can come right on out. And it leads me to this song here, hymn number 428. Nothing between my soul and the sand. Think about your life this evening and all that's going on. I know you've been busy. There's been a lot. Perhaps at work, and in school, some of you are in school now, and a lot happening there. Maybe a little baby that's crying, <laughs> or some other issue in your life. But uh, you know, no matter what, it's always uh, the grace of God in my life. So let's keep our hearts clean and clear of the source of the spring. Make sure it's always been nothing between my soul and the Savior tonight as we think about our relationship with the Lord. churches build churches. They help churches build buildings and renovate facilities. They also, as missionaries, they help travel around and help missionaries on foreign fields also build their churches. Totally free of cost. Now what he does is, as long as the church provides the material, the IBB, Independent Baptist Builders, they go in and they don't charge any labor. Uh, they, pull the, they pull the permits and they come in with their crew and they build as long as the church has all the supplies, uh, they will they will come in and build. So this is what Darren does. He and his wife, Stephanie, and their two children. Let me read you their uh, summer letter here. 
Um, these, hello, praying friends and family. These last few months have been filled with lots of work, travel, and blessings. In April, we continued working at our home church, Grace Baptist Church in Sims, Alabama. We were able to get the basketball goals finished, the scoreboard installed, and the kitchen cabinets installed. We also were able to get the gym floor acid etched, caulked, and painted. On April 24th, our church had a fellowship and dedication service for the new building. Uh, in May, we wrapped up a few small projects around the church, and on May 7th, we left for Dillsboro, Indiana, to help at Hoosier Hills Baptist Camp. While they were able to move some electrical wiring, uh, while there, we were able to move some electrical wiring, wiring, pour concrete, install new windows, install new siding on the church building that was donated to the camp, side and re-roof a small utility building, install new ceilings and the bathrooms at the chapel. We were very thankful to be a part of getting this Christian camp ready for the summer camping season. As of early July, they had 19 kids saved and 532 campers. While we were there, we had the blessing of being able to go to the Creation Museum. We were able, we were back in Alabama for the first two weeks in June. We were thankful that CJ and Leanne White, a family, were able to join us during this time. During these two weeks, we were busy moving the nursery and pastor's office, hanging sheetrock, installing new flooring and lights. We wrapped these projects up and our family along with the White family was back on the road heading to New York City. While in New York, we were helping Pastor Montoro with Union Baptist Church in Brooklyn, Pastor Johnson with Sixth Avenue Baptist Church in Queens. While working at Union Baptist Church, we helped to put on a new roof, build some scaffolding, repair rot, and began to repair so we began to repair the two towers on the building. Uh, this church was a unique challenge to us because this is a historical building and all repairs have to be approved by the Historical Committee of New York City. It was also a challenge because it was built in 1860. Anything that old is going to be made to repair. While repairing the towers, pigeons had made their home in them for the last 40 or so years. CJ and I removed about 300 pounds of pigeon droppings before being able to make repairs to the towers. The city of New York also gave us some challenges with parking and traffic. We only ended up with one love note from the parking police. Uh -huh. <laughs> At 6th Avenue Baptist Church, we removed an old baptistry and found that the subflooring had rotted out and dropped about three inches. So CJ and I tore out the old rotten wood, rebuilt the subfloor, resheated the floor for a new baptistry to be installed. We also added some new lights, removed the old ceiling, and ran new electrical for new lights. While we were in New York, our family was able to see some of the sites. We saw the Statue of Liberty, Ellis Island, the 9-11 Memorial, Times Square, and Central Park. We were even able to see the New York City 4th of July fireworks display in person. Although we spent almost a month in New York, we were still not able to complete the project, and we'll be heading back to finish the work in August. On our way back to Alabama, we stopped in to see old friends in Marietta, Ohio. While there, I was able to preach, give an update to Souls Harbor Baptist Church. We were able also to stay the weekend, but truly enjoy uh, the time we could spend with friends. We finally pulled back into Mobile on July 12th, got right back to work at our home church, building two new classrooms. This including framing, moving electrical, hanging new lights, sheetrock. Stephanie and I are also celebrating our ninth anniversary on July 14th. Praise the Lord for nine great years. Please pray for our family as we have a lot more traveling that is planned for us in the next few months. Also, keep stepping in your prayers for continued healing. Remember, she's had cancer, several cancer, uh, cancer and chemo. She has her next checkup in September, and we are praying for a good report. And he has pictures of all the stuff, all the things that they were doing. So we can see those later. So we'll pray for Brother Darren. Just a neat ministry, you know. We thank the Lord for that. And this is the Maynard family. Um, he is out there in Panama City, and uh, he is working with the children's home. It's a boys' home uh, that was started by his father. And of course, um, uh, the Maynards, uh, Buddy Maynard, his daddy. And of course, uh, we have now his son and his family have continued on working with his dad at the Maynard family children's home. Uh, we're uh, trying to bring these boys to the Lord. A lot of times, courts will send them there uh, because they're in trouble, stuff like that. And uh, they will work with these uh, troubled youth, these boys. It's kind of a boot camp type of thing. Uh, it preaches to them, wins in the Lord, and disciples them. He says, greetings in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. The last three months have been extremely busy in the ministry. We've made many changes at the academy. 
Brother Charles Thulu and his wife Rachel and their six kids have come from Alabama to help us out in ministry. He has been here a short time and already has been a great blessing. The Lord has also sent a longtime friend, Brother Greg Wilson, back to help us with maintenance around property. While he has been a great help fixing all the wear and tear on the log cabin, we still have Brother Micah Reynolds and Miss Trisha Gibbons working here along with my son, Aaron, and myself. Together, we seem to keep everything moving. We finished up graduation with three seniors, six kindergartners, as well as myself and my wife. Tracy and I decided not to walk with our respective colleagues, uh, co colleges and decided to walk with our church kids in the boys' home. I'm officially finished with my master's degree in education and Chris has finished her bachelor's degree in nursing. She has continued on the family nurse practitioner's course with brain these skills being useful when we go back to the leads this fall. This is from his dad, Buddy, but it gives us insight on the, um, the ministry as well. The church is rapidly growing out of our present building, and we are now praying over a new piece of land located directly behind the boys' home. We're looking to put up a church, Christian school, and some cabins for a youth camp. We're also talking about placing a small assisted living home for the elderly. Please help us to pray over this matter. We are tri tipping over 60 kids in our church and desperately need room. On the home front, we've been doing our normal gardening. Brother Micah and Brother Greg have been teaching the boys construction. Aaron, my son, has been teaching them landscaping and lawn care. Though Willow will be getting the greenhouse set up, see the little trees. Hopefully the boys over 18 will learn a new skill and be able to sell some of the things they grow. A young man named Omar was baptized, which is a blessing to us all. It is a blessing that after salvation, the boys want to be obedient to the Lord and make a public testimony of their new walk in Christ. He says everyone's doing well. Keep uh, us in prayer. And then they're going to be going to Belize in the fall on a missions trip. So be a prayer for them. Yeah. And for the buddy Maynard, of course, his son Aaron Maynard is the one that we actually support financially. All right, let's go ahead and pray. And we'll dedicate to pray the Lord bless these two missionaries here. Father, we thank you for the opportunity to be able to have a part in the work of missions. And these two ministries that we've highlighted tonight are somewhat unique and different since uh, they are not church planting ministries, but yet more they are in the business of winning souls, helping churches do and fulfill the Great Commission. So we pray for Brother Darren and his wife. We ask for continued healing for her as she has been having bouts with uh, cancer in the past and has had remission. We pray for continued healing there. And then we pray for their travels as they travel seems like every month they go just hundreds of hundreds of miles to minister and to be a blessing to help churches get their buildings restored, rebuilt, and in some cases built for the first time. So bless them, Lord. And we also pray for Aaron Maynard. We pray for the Maynard family uh, in the children's home there. That we to bless them, help them if they're trying to get property to be able to increase their, uh, their ministry, their camp. We pray for all the blessing and help and all that's going on there. And so we'll thank you. Now, Lord, we also pray just for our ministry here at Crossing Crown. May our missions program continue to grow and be a great help to many missionaries. We pray for Brother Ram, who is still praying for $100,000 or so for that fifth building they're trying to build for the fifth church. And we pray that you just continue to help them meet that need as well. Thank you, Lord, for allowing us to be part of the missions work that you have this will in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Okay, let's go ahead and take out our prayer sheets and we will update some prayer requests at this time. Which you might have. And so uh, let's just go down through there. You can see a number of things going on that we've included last time, but maybe some things I have forgotten to add. So let me know. Um, students at PCC have gotten well underway, they're all going again. So I know they're excited about that other students as well, so let's keep on praying for them. Brother J.B. is out of town. He wanted us to pray for his travels back uh, probably Thursday or Friday. And then uh, also, um, any other general requests to pray for him. By, by the way, good to have Pace back with us. How was Mississippi? Turn out okay? It's still there. It's still there. <laughs> did you get your ladder, brother? I did. Did you get any mulch? No, I did not. You didn't do mulch? I was Laid around my house and been lazy. Ah, okay. Sometimes we just do that. I understand. I'm glad you guys made it back safely. 
Anybody else traveling or any other? There's any general requests going on? Yeah. Uh, this is more of a phrase of request. Yeah. But, um, and you know that I had decisions that I had to make uh, regarding something that was coming up and I prayed about it. And it was just amazing that it ended up being one of the easiest, hard decisions that I've made. And I, I know I prayed about it and talked to Pastor Davis and made the right decision and, and everything went well as a result. So very thankful for him to pray. Yes. 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 I'm thankful too that uh, we got the baseboard off the the wet room, I guess, in my house. <laughs> what if you want to call it that? Okay. The room that has water damage, and um, as far as Jack could tell, there's no mold under there or no mold on the back, and so we're just waiting for it to dry out, and maybe for like no, some more. I don't know. Okay. Yeah. So, yeah. So we don't need to break down drywall at this point in time. Yeah. I'm grateful. <laughs> All right, anybody else? Yes, too. Sure. Um, I just want to the Lord for the fact that I have so pretty amazing events this year. Um, uh, that's really small. I guess it's a small phrase, but I'm just thankful that God gives her a little unspoken prayer. It's just a generous word at all. <laughs> How is it really going to be? And uh, one of your roommates is here. Sound, but she's our she's our assistant sound technician working in the back back there. Anybody else? Yes. Shane and Jessica need to sell their house on the west side so they can start building on here and make them. Aiden's mom and dad. Yes, Shane and Jessica Quinn. Right. Another house to sell. I know. Well, I mean, just looking at our list, we've got several. He's got to get him sold. But their houses are selling good in their neighborhood. So. Military building. Oh, yeah, yeah. yeah. should go. Okay, we'll pray for that. That'd be awesome. I saw that thing real quick. Yes, Titus. I'm stuck with the house. I'm going to pray that. We're going to go with Del Menara. It's more good. It's uh, definitely going to go a lot smoother than knowing that it's just the door could also be closed. <laughs> so. It's still between those two. Yeah. We'll see how it goes. Okay. Trying to find lens as we have three houses to sell. They are trying to buy one. Same thing over there. Okay. All right. Going on to uh, spiritual needs. Keep on praying for these that are here. Are you listed? Any other additions for the spiritual? I'd like to add one. I met a new um, friend this week. Actually, Haley, my niece, she has a new boyfriend. His name is Josh. So put his name down. He's his boyfriend. And on Labor Day, we had a cookout with them, and they came up. And he had uh, cooked food together with us and uh, had a talk with them. Kind of quiet young man, but um, I, don't, I don't think he's saved from what I understand from my brother Jason. And so pray for his salvation. I'd like to see him come to know the Lord. He's a drummer. Um, when I say drummer, it's not what you're thinking. He is uh, Indian. And so he takes one of those big drum uh, sticks and he sits around with six other men with a big drum in the middle and they beat the drum. Uh, like Indians do, and uh, that's what he does. He's actually in the home core, and uh, they compete, stuff like that. Have you ever been up to the powwow and seen those guys do that? You don't know what I'm talking about. They make uh, Mickey Goose Clubs listen to them where they scream and holler, but uh, it's, uh, it's interesting. But it's a spiritual thing, too, and uh, he, he talks about his, his drum has a uh, spirit, stuff like that. So he needs to be saved. Any other spiritual? Yeah, Titus. Pray for uh, another one of my coworkers, Cynthia Walsh, and my coworker, the uh, customer. Um, she, her father passed away this past week. The reason I found out was she was very disturbed when I talked to her once. I just was texting her. 
the full full range. So she was pretty upset about it from what I understood. And um right up and I have a chance to ask her if um uh, she said in any case. She uh I didn't mention that we were very poor and she said thanks. Okay, we get the health needs. You see for the miles, keep praying for him. I've added some new ones on here. My wife's Aunt Wanda, um, she has the shingles. She has actually had them and has for weeks now, six and a half weeks, and still has a hard time putting clothing on. Uh, you never, you know, I'm talking about that night, I talk about shingles, you know how bad it can be, especially for older folks. She's probably seven, so you can imagine how difficult that can be. Becca Mowers, we did get the word tonight that uh, we, uh, actually it was Ed Rihanna, but this is the niece, Becca Mowers' niece, premature birth. We mentioned that situation on Sunday. But also, little Joseph Mowers, he's not feeling well, so if you could please put him on there. And, uh, that's where they are. And then Debbie, Debbie fell yesterday. Little the Olivers. Checking on their house, and then um, pick up Abby, who was able to help out over there. And on the way out the back door, you know how you push the garage door button and you try to run out before it closes, that kind of thing. Is that what you did, something like that? Yeah, she tried to go down the steps. It's totally unfamiliar to her, and down she went. She twisted and fell on the steps, so hurt her foot and probably her hip. So praying that she. Recover well. You want to say anything about that? No? <laughs> okay. Let's pray for Debbie. Any other health situations? Yeah. I have a question for Mr. Black. It, it sounds pretty good. They were tethering it. Some were staying on the street for the day. Pretty good, pretty good. Uh, I talked to him one day. Uh, he said, I haven't heard the results of the pain. Kevin's putting his neck and mic. You can see it about halfway down in the health. Yeah, my leg's been hurting lately. I believe it might be my sciatic nerve, but uh, right now I don't have a clue. No. We go to a chiropractor Friday and we try and go that route and see if we can just relieve pain without medication. Sure. And so, Joyce, you still have your boot on? Oh, no. Okay. You say you're hobbling and you're hobbling. You guys just hang on to each other and uh, walk together. Yes. My mom's going for an MRI on Sunday. Um, she keeps saying bad migraine, and they want us to listen to the Sunday or the podcast. We just pray that she will find something and that we'll be able to figure something out by the next day. Brenda's mom having an MRI on Sunday? On Sunday. Migraine hair. Y'all go ahead and add on my brother Jason. Is, he is going to have the bariatric surgery on October the 3rd. And so he's been cleared with his heart doctor, cleared with a gastro doctor, and now he's trying to be cleared with the lung doctor. And then he's going to start the two week liquid only diet. And he'll start that in a couple of weeks. And then that'll take him to October 3rd. And then he's going to have the surgery. So he's kind of nervous. Right, Lisa? Yes. Yes. Uh, I have oh, three of you in a row right here. Let's start with Josh and then go down. I just have a phrase. My my phrase is that my uh, my new job is uh, great. I really enjoy it and uh, I 
I was a little nervous about it at first, but I love the people I work with and I like the work. So. Amen. Okay. Yes. Um, it's a pray at the end of request for prayer. I have a nephew who's 55 and he has cancer. He had a rare form of leukemia and it wasn't bothering him for a while and all of a sudden this um, late spring, summer starts bothering him. And he ended up going to John Hopkins and then they he had chemo locally in Williamsport and his health have risen, has come good. He may have to have bone marrow transplant. His one sister is a perfect match. Mm -hmm. There's a lot of praise, but a lot of prayer still needed. What's his name? Ray Mahaffey. Ray. How old did you say? Fifty-five. Fifty-five. And then Aaron. I had a praise. Uh, I just wanted to praise God for you know even when the devil's trying to pull you down as far as work goes or anything in life, God's always there to like encourage you. So amen. Circumstances are not the foundation of our peace and our joy. They get in the way, but God just gives me more. Yes, please. Uh, this is great for Dana. She had three weeks Yay! Yeah, I wish she's excited about that. Pray for Danny, uh, Lisa's friend. She uh, lost her first baby and now she's getting pregnant again. She's about to have this one. So I'm going to be excited. All right. Tell you what, let's do this. Um, I'm just going to pray where we are sitting right now. I'll go ahead and, and then um, let's just let's just all just spend, spend some time in prayer by ourselves, like we are, um, just kind of say moving around, and um, and then I'll close in prayer and then we'll get right into our study. Okay, let's go ahead and go to prayer where we are.
Father, we thank you for the great grace you've given to us that we might be saved. We thank you for the privilege we have to pray tonight, and we ask that you would watch over all of the requests. We lifted them up, Lord, and we ask now that we would just send a measure of grace to each, each situation, the healing of those that are sick, those that are hurting, those with cancer. May you would touch their bodies and give them special healing and grace. God, we also pray for special wisdom, decisions that need to be made every single day. We make so many decisions without even thinking. We pray for wisdom and discernment. Help our people. And those that have special decisions to make, Lord, guide and direct them. There's so many things that need to happen that we're praying about, houses to sell, houses to buy, school decisions, so many things, traveling mercies, our nation needs guidance as we're just 60 days or so away from the elections for our country. God, would you just oversee, would you bless and help in all of these situations? Now, Lord, we thank you for the great opportunity we have to study your word. What a privilege it is. Thank you for preserving the word of God, giving it to us after all of these years. We still have an accurate, wonderful, inspired copy of the word of God. Thank you for that. And we pray you help us as we study your word tonight. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Okay, let's take our Bibles and let's go over to the book of Judges. And... Um, I want to just give you some introductory remarks tonight. Of course, as I mentioned before, Judges, you know, 21 chapters, is going to be hard to cover quickly. And uh, sometimes we'll go quick. Sometimes we might take a, take a break or take a, uh, a time of a deeper study in one particular thing. So I'm not going to be going verse by verse. I'm not going to go chapter by chapter even necessarily. But theme by theme, highlights, that kind of thing is what we're probably going to be looking at because of uh, the way it's all laid out. So let's talk about it, okay? Judges is that book. Are we not working? Oh, wait a minute. I'm learning to look up now. My wife says, when people are waving, that means something's wrong. And so uh, I am going to be looking. Well, when you think about the book of Judges, what we really have is a sad commentary. I want you to turn, well, you don't need to, let's show you this. Look at this verse. This is from Jeremiah chapter two and verse seven really is the commentary for the book of Judges. I brought you into a plentiful country to eat the fruit thereof and the goodness thereof, but when ye entered, ye defiled my land and made my heritage an abomination. You know, that's what they did. Here, I remember Joshua, the great book, where, where the, the great story of Joshua, the great leader, the general after Moses, led them all into the promised land. They conquered all of that land, and now they were in there ready to go, and then they made it an abomination is what God says. That's what Jay Sidlow Baxter says. Although we cannot obliterate the tragic record, let us be quick to learn from it, the book of Judges that is. For although it is such a pathetic anti-climax to the book of Joshua, it is nevertheless one of the richest books of scripture in the salutary lessons and examples which it contains. So the book of Judges, although it is a sad commentary and it is anticlimactic, it seems, but why did God give it to us? Well, there's a lot of lessons to learn. Now, first of all, we call this the book of Judges. For those of you young people that are in here, this is going to be very elementary for you. It is called the book of Judges for a reason. The name comes from the contents of the book. Judges were provided by God to deliver and protect the people of Israel during this time. Now, I think it's also interesting to note the 400s is what we call it. Uh, as you study the scriptures, there was periods of time called the 400s, the 400 years or thereabouts. For instance, from the birth of Abraham to the death of Joseph in Egypt, we call that the family period of Israel. It was still quite a family unit that was there. Then the death of Joseph to the exile, uh, we know there was a tribal identity there going on. Not just the family, but they've grown so much, now we're looking at them as a tribe. And then from the Exodus to the first king, King Saul, we call this a theocracy period. There's no king in Israel at that time. God is just ruling over his people through his high priest and through the judges. That's the time we're talking about right now, the theocracy period. 
and again, about 350 to 400 years, but most people just say the 400. And then from Saul, King Saul the first king, to the last governor, Zedekiah, over Israel, and when they left in the exile, that was called the monarchy period of all the different kings. So the 400s, you have four periods like that when you're studying the scriptures, that God kind of was working through Israel at 400-year intervals. Now, what is our time context? Well, roughly, there's 350 years of Israel's history in Canaan. So when Joshua led them into the Canaan land, we have about 350 years is what Judges is going to cover. Okay, so right about that time, it's also known as the theocratic regime. No king in Israel, and yet God still rules over Israel himself. Jehovah himself is Israel's king invisible, is the picture there. Another quote here, the theocracy was a glorious experiment with superlative possibilities. I like that. Superlative possibilities, and Israel's failure is therefore the more tragic. So you got to think about this now. This was the greatest nation of all time. Without a king, God was ruling over Israel. There was no king, and simply we had a high priest. We had the tabernacle was there. The, the Ark of the Covenant was there. And they knew to go to God, and God was using the priests and the, and the Levites to direct them spiritually, and God would have just taken care of them. And that's why it's called a superlative possibility, a theocracy. But yet, they blew it. And so then it will lead us to the monarchy later on. So who were these judges then that God is going to use during this particular time? Now, I'm not going to talk about their names, but who were they in their character? First of all, understand the judges were not regular succession of governors. Matter of fact, the book of Judges really is not even that good of a history book. When you think of Judges, most scholars look at Judges and say, man, it doesn't really have a chronological history. It's almost like, well, you've got this story, and then you've got this story, and this story, but it leaves out a lot of stuff in between. So it's really not even a good history. It wasn't meant to be history. It was meant to be I'll show you just a second, a record of the life of Israel and their failure and the lessons to be learned. But understanding these governors, remember, these were not succession of governors. Well, this governor reigned, and then there was another governor, then another governor. Not at all. These guys come from different backgrounds. They come from different geographical locations, from different families, tribal differences. All of that was different. So these judges are not a succession of governors. They were deliverers raised up by God. They did not assume royal authority as a king. These judges were not kings. They were just normal guys and women uh, in, in certain situations as well where God used them to deliver Israel. But they did this. They did act as vice regents of Jehovah, the invisible king. So, yes, they were not, they, they were, uh, had authority given to them by God himself, but they weren't looked at as kings. They were looked at as vice regents, that God was moving and God was working, and they used, the, he used these particular individuals to deliver Israel. And the people knew that, especially with all the miracles and wild things that they were able to do. Remember Samson and his great strength? Uh, remember Gideon and the fleece? Remember all those types of things that happened? Those were weird stories. Things that took place that the people knew that these men were used of God and there was something powerful there. So who wrote the book of Judges? Good question. We know God inspired it. We have it now. But who was the writer? I think it was Samuel. We're, not, we're, not, we're never told who it was that wrote this book. But there's a really good reason why most scholars think Samuel probably compiled and wrote the book because it was kind of his time frame. In Judges chapter 17 and verse 6, you know this verse, you've heard it before. In those days there was no king in Israel, but every man did that which was right in his own eyes. Now whenever you're studying the Bible, you have to look for clues to understand it. So when you look at a verse like that, look for the clues. In those days. So what he's saying is whoever the writer is, he's not talking about his present time, is he? He's saying in those days. Back in the days of the judges, let's see, uh, no, come up here and sit next to Aaron. Come up, thank you. In those days, there was no king in Israel. That means that there was a time when he looked back and said, okay, as I tell you about the story of judges, in those days, it was an old time when there was no king in Israel. So that tells you that whoever's writing this, there was a king. And he says, in those days, there was no king. 
So the clue is, whoever wrote this, he's writing at a time when there's a king. So we know it had to be someone who wrote it during a time when there was a king. Every man did that which was right. So when there was a king in Israel, that king probably was King Saul, the very first king. How do I know that? Well, Judges 121 tells us the Jebusites were not driven out of Jerusalem at the time when Judges was written. But what's interesting about that? What's the clue there? Well, we know that David, the second king of Israel, drove out the Jebusites. So at the time of whoever compiled all this, there was a king, and the Jebusites were still in Jerusalem. And the only king where that happened was Saul. And the only man who was prominent enough and of the spiritual quality to do something like write a book or compile it was Samuel, who lived at that time. So most scholars look at that and say Samuel is probably the one that wrote this book. So before David and when a king was on the throne, most prominent person at the time was then Samuel. All right now, take your, um, well, we'll look at just a second. What happened after Joshua? Remember the story? Joshua chapter 24. Take your Bible and take a look at that, and you'll see. Uh, the last chapter of Joshua, you're in Judges, just turn one page back and you'll see in verse 31, the Bible says, And Israel served the Lord all the days of Joshua and all the days of the elders that overlived Joshua, which had known all the works of the Lord that he had done for Israel. And so what has happened now is Joshua is dead. And as we get into the book of Judges, that next generation, Joshua's now gone, that generation is now alive that saw Joshua, saw the works, and were now living in Israel, the land of Canaan. This is what it looked like. This is the actual uh, depiction of all that, and you can kind of see all the different tribes there. There is Judah, and that is your leading tribe in Jerusalem. Simeon was given part of Judah's inheritance right there. Benjamin, remember Jerusalem was right on the Judah and Benjamin line. There, uh, there's Benjamin, and all the different tribes are there. Okay, so remember Reuben and Gad and half the tribe of Manasseh. There's the other half. The two tribes split in half. It was Manasseh. They stayed on that side. Remember that story? So here we are. We're all in Jerusalem now. They're all nice and tidy. They have their lands, but the problem is there's a lot of enemies still there. Now they conquered. That's right, but there's still. Thousands and thousands of natives still living there, and they're mad. You imagine how mad they are? They've just been conquered, and they're in the guerrilla warfare. They're trying their best now to kick Israel out. So this is what Joshua left them. Joshua gave them inheritance. They're now in there, and God had told them, if you follow me and obey me, you will inherit this land forever. This is your land. This is the promised land. I came across this. I thought this was interesting. Look at the topography of this. When you think of Israel, you think of a flat place, but Israel really is not flat at all. Very mountainous. And you see all there, there's the Dead Sea and the Jordan Valley right in here. And you can see Mount Hermon way up here, snow capped. When you think of snow capped mountain, how tall are you looking? Okay. And then it goes downhill from there to the Dead Sea, one of the lowest places on the earth. So you're going from a snow capped mountain all the way down there, and you can imagine the descent as you go. Not only that, but all these different places, you're coming up mountainous areas all around Israel, all up in here. And when you look at pictures of Israel, you really do see a beautiful, beautiful place with lots of mountains and rocks everywhere. It's not what you normally think. In my mind, I was thinking flat. But the more that you study, you can understand where Israel is right now. This place is just amazingly mountainous. Now, now put that in the context of these people. For the context of them trying now to defeat this enemy who are hiding in the rocks and the caves and the woods and the valleys, and God said, "Go get them out of that land, drive them out." So that was their that was their mission. So the first generation. Take a look at uh, J uh, Judges chapter one and verse one. Now, after the death of Joshua, it came to pass that the children of Israel asked the Lord, saying, "Who shall go up for us against the Canaanites first to fight against them?" The Lord said, Judah shall go up. Behold, I have delivered the land into his hand. And so Judah goes up. And then what you find is Judah, the chosen tribe, the leading tribe. Remember, this is where the royal tribe will be, the future royal tribe. And they have a great victory. I'm going to go real quick. This is just overview. They have a victory. 10,000 people are, are slain. They subdued the king. And then Judah drove out most of the inhabitants, not all of them, keep that in mind. He didn't do all of them, just most of them. And then the Benjamites, they could not drive out the Jebusites. We already talked about that. They tried, couldn't do it. 
Joseph, remember the tribe of Joseph is Ephraim and Manasseh. Uh, he had victory driving out the enemy, but again, still left people in the land. Manasseh failed to drive out their enemy. Ephraim failed to drive out their enemies. Asher failed to drive out their enemy. Naphtali failed to drive out their enemy. Dan was forced to live in the mountains. So here you have this generation that lived when Joshua lived, and they remember Joshua, but now he's gone. They're getting older. They haven't passed on the scene yet, but they just don't have the motivation or the drive to conquer the land. And so that's going to be a problem. Instead of conquering, they're going to leave the enemy in the land. The first generation began to slide politically and militarily as they did not have the ability nor the motivation to drive out the enemy. Not only did this generation slide politically and militarily, they also began to slide spiritually. So when life in Canaan was tolerably comfortable, even with the enemy living beside them, they simply would turn their back on the Lord. Now this is going to be the problem. They turned their back on the Lord. They would not observe the commands given by Moses. They would not follow the charge left by Joshua. Remember this? Now turn back to Joshua chapter 24. In this passage of Scripture, this is where they actually gave uh, an affirmation that they would follow the Lord. So look at chapter 24 of Joshua, look at verse 14. Now therefore fear the Lord and serve him in sincerity and in truth and put away the gods which your fathers served on the other side of the flood and in Egypt and serve you the Lord. And here's this famous verse we all know so well. If it seem evil unto you to serve the Lord, choose you this day whom you will serve. Whether the gods which your fathers served that were on the other side of the flood, or the gods of the Amorites in whose land you now dwell. But as for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. Remember that verse? And notice verse 16. And the people answered and said, God forbid that we should forsake the Lord to serve other gods. They had said, we will serve the Lord. We will be faithful. But they began to indulge in the wicked practices of the heathen that were living around them. See, when they did not drive them out, those same people, those idols and uh, altars where they sacrificed to Baal and Ashtaroth and the other Sidonians and other Canaanites, they didn't destroy them all. And so they began to be tempted by them. And because of that, God would allow them to suffer and be afflicted. So here this is what happens. When the suffering came and then they would cry out to God, oh, these people are so bad. They're coming in and taking our crops. These people are killing our people. They're, they're taking our children, making them slaves. And we don't have any weapons. We can't fight. And so Israel cried out, oh, God, please help us. And so God would allow them to go through that time. But then he would raise up a deliverer called the judge. Now, the judge, God raised up, are living object lessons by which God sought to preserve in Israel the understanding that faith in Jehovah, the only true God, was the only one way victory and well being. The only way is through Jesus, or through, through God, Jehovah, and that was the idea. And so God would save them. But what would they do? As soon as things became peaceful and comfortable again, with the enemy still living in their midst, they would once again forsake the Lord. God would raise up another judge to deliver them, then they would forsake the Lord again. And we call it, again, this became a sin cycle for the next 350 to 400 years. So they would be blessed, they would fall, they would cry out to God, God was the deliverer, and they would fall over and over again. Picture, I like this. This is the sin cycle that you'll find throughout the book of Judges. Every time God brings a judge into the view, it's a result of this cycle. And you can take a look at it with me here, what we find in the cycle. First of all, you see there's peace in the land. They left it one. But Israel does evil in the eyes of the Lord. They don't serve God like they should. And so God punishes Israel. And Israel is enslaved by the people of the land. Israel cries out to God, oh, we're so, we need help, God, we're so sorry. And so God raises up a judge. One of those judges was Samuel, one is Barak, one is Gideon, and all the different ones, right? You know all the different judges that are there. And then Israel is delivered by that judge, woo -hoo! And then there's peace in the land, way wonderful. And do it again. Again, and again, and again, and again, watch the thing, and you'll go to sleep, again, and again, right? That's the cycle that's there. 
And so Judges is all about that cycle that they find that we find uh, in uh, the life of the judges in Israel. Okay. So quick about this tragic decline. The answer of the sentence of the book. Why the cycle? Why do they constantly fall in? Why are they struggling in their spiritual life, their walk with Jehovah? What is the main reason? What is really the whole reason for the book? Are you ready? This is it. This, this, is, the, this is where the rubber meets the road. This is it. It is failure through compromise. See, the whole reason why we even have this book, I believe, is God's trying to show us that when we compromise, even in the smallest things of our life, we will find ourselves falling into sin. And that's when God, again, merciful, always brings it up, brings a judge, but still they go through the difficulty. So how did all of it begin? Well, in the first chapter, nine and a half tribes did not drive out and destroy the enemy as commanded. They left them there. Get that? They left them there. Eight conquests that we read in chapter 1 ended incompletely with the enemy still in the land. Incomplete mastery of an evil at the outset always means constant trouble from it afterwards. Often defeat by it in the end. Israel allowed quarter to the foe and lived to root it. Well, that's true. And so again, when we find the scripture to say that really, if, if we don't have execution or if judgment does not meet it out speedily when there is an offense you're going to find that you're going to pay for it again and again and again and by the way think about that even now think about those individuals i'm just amazed at how many people when they kill someone or they i've heard recently about this these people this man who has abducted 11 year old and and killed him and buried his body and now he's confessing to the to the death of this 11 year old boy and they're probably going to take him, try him, and put him in jail, you know, for however many years. Why not just kill him? The Bible talks about that. And so I, I just wonder to myself, don't we understand that if you allow something to exist, you allow this to keep on going, and in the end, you're going to pay for it again and again and again. It's an amazing thing, isn't it? So even our own life spiritually, if we allow things to stay in there that are going to draw us down because, well, it's not that big of a deal, you're going to find yourself being tempted by it over and over again every single day. This is exactly what Israel did. So let's talk about the steps to compromise and I'll let you go. Ready? So what are, if compromise is the reason why they fail, number one, how do we compromise? Well, we allow the existence of evil to remain in the land. They allow the existence of those nations to remain for whatever reason. Maybe they were tired of fighting. Maybe they didn't feel like they had the ability to do it. But for whatever reason, they did not drive them out. God said, I will be with you. And he did bless them all, as long as he trusted them. But because they let them stay in the land, that was going to be an issue. The presence was there. We'll talk about this in Sunday school on Sunday mornings as well. When we allow things into our homes, into our families, we start allowing things there and say it's no big deal. That will influence your kids. It will influence you. It's better to drive those things out of your home, those things out of your life. Don't even allow it to be there. It's the best thing, okay? Because you will end up fighting it constantly until you get rid of it. The second thing they did was they made a league with the evil land around them, partnering with them, covenanting with them, even marrying their offspring uh, together with the evil that was there. So the idea is, you know, once you allow something in your house, you find yourself starting to engage in it. Maybe it's with friends. I used to have these friends while I got saved. Well, rather than making a clean break with that, well, I just still want to hang around. And what happens is you start, again, partnering and hanging with them, and it's going to pull you down. Okay. And then number three, participating in the evil of the land. So leaving them there, making a league, you eventually find yourself participating with them as well. Bowing to their idols, they forsook Jehovah, and they began to serve the same gods. And we're going to get into all of that. We're going to show you what they did uh, as we go through it. That work was the steps of their compromise. We can never enjoy God's promised rest for long if we tolerate only partially crushed sins to continue with us. If we make league with questionable things because they seem harmless, we shall soon find ourselves wedded to the desires of the flesh again and down from the heights to which God lifted us. You know, God saved you, and you're serving the Lord, but you're going to get pulled down again and again if you allow those things to stay in your life. Here's our last takeaway. What a wonderful passage. 
It's an Old Testament passage given to us in the New Testament. Wherefore, come out from among them and be ye separate, saith the Lord, and touch not the unclean thing, and I will receive you. I'll be a father unto you, and you shall be my sons and daughters, saith the Lord Almighty. That's our takeaway. You know, as we've been thinking about getting the book of Judges, understand that God gave us this book to show us that we will fail through compromise. But if we will trust the Lord and drive out the enemy out of the land, our life, if we will drive out the enemy, drive out those evil spiritual influences in our life, that the thing that does so easily beset me, drive it out. Don't tolerate that. Or just like we talked about a little bit earlier, decisions that you make, well, it's just a little thing. It's not going to be that big of a deal if I go here or if I do this or I take this drink or I, I just smoke this one thing. See, beloved, when you start doing that and you start allowing it to become existing there, you'll eventually find yourself partaking in it and then you'll find yourself falling. And so come out from among them and be sent. Take that challenge and allow God to cleanse your life. And God will bless you for that. Next week, we'll start looking at the, the first uh, judge and start getting into some of the exciting things as well. Okay? Father, thank you for allowing us to be together tonight. We pray that you bless us as we go our separate ways. Thank you again for the lessons we're going to learn in Jesus' name. Amen. A couple announcements. Power Teams, Friday. It's uh, New York night, right? No, it was like, what's this Friday? Oh, fast. It's right. You guys are going to the go-kart place. Fast Eddie's at 7 o'clock. We meet at Fast Eddie's at 7. Now I'm here and bring $10. Okay, don't forget that. Uh, also, JV, want to mention to you that Saturday at 10 a.m., we need people uh, to come out and help us with the bus ministry. He wants people just to show up and sit in the bus and act like kids so that the bus leaders can have an example to work with. Okay, so come on out just for fun. Saturday at 10 a.m. And then uh, men's breakfast, don't forget, 8 a.m. this Saturday, guys, this Saturday, 8 o'clock. Bring something, cook it with us, throw it together, we'll have a men's meeting and a prayer breakfast at 8. And then bus time at 10. And then joy, if you are in the joy ministry, that means if you're in the 40 to 50, 55 category or 60 category, uh, 4.30, we're starting at Stephanie's house and uh, starting a progressive dinner. So looking forward to that uh, at that time. Okay, so that's on Saturday. All right. Uh, I think that's all I have. You're dismissed. God bless you guys. Of course, I didn't know it for many, many years ago.